Okay. So I want to use the fact that we are flipping the classes to really take advantage and give us more time to look at certain things that we would not be able to look at otherwise. So I'm not going to go through all the detailed explanations of spherical and cylindrical coordinates for two reasons. One, if you understand polar coordinates, the only difference in cylindrical coordinates is you write z equals z and dz equals dz. So going from polar to cylindrical is not that bad. For spherical, I go through in the notes, I think, a little bit of the details as to how you would estimate, uh, I'm sorry, how, how you calculate the change in the infinitesimal volume element. Rather than going through that calculation, which is on the web, I thought I would do a good problem for once. All right. I assume everybody can recognize what this is. Out of curiosity, how many people have this or their parents have this at home? This is one of the more famous. Okay. Most of the problems you do in classes are... Cookbook problems, they're problems that nobody cares about. I don't care about that. Oh, I gotta be careful because my wife cares about that book. I don't care about that book, I don't care about cookbook problems. Why do we give you cookbook problems? I'm sorry? Practice. Practice. We want you to build skills. And what do we eventually want you to do after you build those skills? Real Apply them to real problems. So what I thought I would do today is, rather than doing more cookbook problems, I thought I would actually do one of the most important problems in all of mathematical physics. And so this goes back to Newton's laws of motion, Newton's law of gravity. How do you predict the orbits of planets? How do you predict the orbits of paths? And one of the biggest difficulties is if you have a mass, let's say for simplicity the mass is a sphere, sphere right? and the density is uniform. Big big difficulty. Every little point on that sphere is attracting your object. Wouldn't it be nice if all of the mass was concentrated at the center of the sphere? And so one of the biggest calculations is that for all practical purposes, when you're trying to calculate the effect of a mass on another mass, if it's spherical, you may assume all the mass is at the origin. And that makes the calculation significantly easier. What coordinate systems do you think might be useful for this calculation? Spherical coordinate. Mm -hmm. So I thought I would do the spherical <coughs> coordinate calculation that all of the mass may be regarded at the center. It's actually a somewhat difficult calculation, even in spherical <coughs> coordinates. There are different tricks you can do to make it easier. It's a great way to review some use substitutions and some various things. Great way to review some of the stuff we've done earlier this semester. So it's going to be a good use of our time. How many of you have ever heard the expression grand tour? If you've read literary books... You might have heard the expression, in the old days, people would take a grand tour to Europe, go to certain key countries. That's a very provincial, terrestrial version of the grand tour. Anybody know the real grand tour? Tour of the universe. <laughs> <coughs> Whatever the opposite of provincial is, that's way too much on that side. <laughs> we can't quite go for the tour of the universe. But we can at least do a tour of the solar system. And so here is at least, you know, a very bad resolution. You're the beginning of the solar system. You're, there's the sun. There's a couple of our planets nearby. And the grand tour is sending a probe that can visit as many of the planets as possible. And so, you know, ideally, you would visit how many? Eight, nine, depends on your view of, you know, where Pluto should be. The inner planets and the outer planets are, in some sense, in a very different category. So for a lot of people, it's enough to just visit the really outer ones. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. And these are the more difficult ones to visit. Why are these ones harder to visit? Asteroid belt? Asteroid belt's not too bad to avoid. They're much further away. So when you think of you know, how long it takes sunlight to reach the Earth from the sun, we're talking eight to nine minutes. I think to Pluto, it's on the order of, I think, six hours. Significantly longer to get there. And it's very difficult you know, to have these ships get there in our lifetime. The other thing, of course, is, well, if the planets are on different sides of the sun, it's going to be very expensive. You know, I can't go to Jupiter and go all the way back to, you know, very, very expensive. Every now and then, a couple hundred years the outer planets align in such a way that one probe can visit all of them. And one of the big ways to make this happen is what's called the gravity slingshot effect. How many of you have seen 2010? Uh, if you've seen 2010, they have, I think, a scene where they're going into the pouches to get the gravity slingshot. Might be 2000, I think it's 2010. 
2001. Oh, so when was 2001? I'm sorry? When was 2001? The other one was 2001, A Space Odyssey? Yeah. That was the original. That was the original. Oh, was it 2001 they did the slingshot? Okay, it was 2001, I think they did the slingshot. I'm sorry. 2001 where they did the slingshot. Um, and what they do is they use the gravitational effects of the different planets to give the probes a boost. And so in the late 60s, NASA knew that the window for the Grand Tour was opening up. The problem was they didn't quite have the technology yet to build the spacecraft to actually take advantage of the Grand Tour. Well, since the next Grand Tour doesn't happen for a couple hundred years, you have to make do with what you have. And so the Voyager space mission is one of the most phenomenal things to read about. And I'll put some links to this. They basically launched the best probe they could at the time, counting on the fact that they would be able to reprogram this probe from Earth and update it years later as it gets closer and closer to the sun. Basically, we'll just launch with what we have and we will do a remote house call. The computational power of you know, a smartphone to the Voyager, I don't think it's a comparison at all. I think this beats it by orders of magnitude. It is phenomenal what they are doing. The difficulty in actually sending the information and making sure that they can understand, you know, on both ends, that the, the Voyager space probes can understand what we're sending, and conversely, we can understand the data it's sending back. How do you build in redundancies for transmitting things billions of miles over very old static equipment? So what I thought I would do today is start off a little bit with, you know, cheesy music, and you're know, talking a little bit about, you know, how you would go and do something like this. So at some point we're going to launch from Earth, we <coughs> launched from Earth, this is Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, Voyager 1, Voyager 2, coming up to Saturn, Voyager 1 is now gone I believe, Voyager, or maybe it's the other way around, I forget which one is which, passes Saturn, and again, you know, these calculations have to be done perfectly, and so we're going to see today the beginning of how to do something like this takes the gravity boost in just the right way, and it's going to get to Neptune as well. So it's going to hit all four of the big gas giants. And it was a phenomenal bonanza of scientific discovery in terms of what it was able to get. Okay. Okay. So unfortunately, this is going to be the first year I have taught a calculus class where I can't take you to the Rare Books Library to see the first edition of Newton's Principia. Copernicus and all that stuff, because this stuff is unavailable due to renovations. So I will just say a few words about that before going into the spherical stuff. The ancients knew up to Saturn. Nobody had seen a planet after Saturn. It wasn't until the 1700s when Herschel discovered the planet after Saturn. And the planet is? Uranus. Uranus. And they named that because Saturn was Jupiter's father, so they went for who would Saturn's father have been. That was not the original proposed name. Does anybody know the original proposed name of Uranus? Probably the greatest example of attempted ass-kissing in the history of science. Herschel decided to name it King George's star after <laughs> King George, his sovereign. His sovereign was very <coughs> pleased with the suggested name. The rest of Europe was not. And, you know, England, Britain was outvoted, and King George's star did not survive as a name. So, new planet was discovered. Uh, at this point, we have Newton's laws of gravity. It does a wonderful job of explaining where things are. Fast forward about 100 years or so, and they start noticing that Newton's laws of gravity is not properly predicting where Uranus should be. So very quickly, people came up with two possibilities. Either Newton's law of gravity is wrong, which would be very bad because it worked so well for so long, or what else? There's another planet. There's another planet. And in one of the greatest examples of mathematics before computers, they calculated where this planet should be, and they told the astronomers where to point their telescopes. And there was a French team, and there was a British team. The British person sadly could not convince his astronomers to point the telescopes there. The Frenchman... Lavalier, I think is how you pronounce his name, was the first one to successfully find Neptune. It was a phenomenal achievement to do these calculations by hand, analyzing the orbital deviations of Neptune, and figure out where this planet should be. After a while, they noticed that the orbit of Mercury was off by a little bit. So imagine you have just predicted the existence of a planet 
to fix the orbital you know, errors in Uranus. What do you do when you see that there are orbital deviations in Mercury? What's a natural thing to do? Let's go for another planet. Go for another planet. Where should that planet be? So Mercury's orbit is off by a little bit, and of all the other, and all of the planets, it's Mercury's orbit that's off by the most. So where would you put this missing planet? Closer to the sun. Closer to the sun. Now, what's the difficulty in predicting a planet close to the sun? Anybody think of any difficulties for astronomers? You can't really oh, yeah. observe it. Can I'm you, sorry? You can't really observe it. It's going to be extremely hard to see it because you're looking straight yeah. into the sun. So there were only a few times when there would be a good window for observing this planet. And so they told people where to point their telescopes. And what do you think happened? They didn't see anything. Almost. Most people didn't see anything. <laughs> and again, this is one of the real dangers in science. If you think there is something, will this influence you're viewing data. And so a couple of people claim to have seen this planet. They named the planet Vulcan. One of the reasons I am wearing this shirt today. It is not after Spock's, oh, should we smile? It is not after Spock's people. Vulcan is named that way because of? I'm sorry? Because it's hot. It's hot. Vulcan is the Roman god of the forge, so they named the planet Vulcan. And then what happened is as they got better and better telescopes, they could say, hmm, if Vulcan exists, it can be no bigger than this, then no bigger than this, then no bigger than this, and eventually it was no bigger than a couple of asteroids. And it reached the point where there was no longer enough mass to really fix the problems with Mercury. And so it turns out the solution wasn't done until Einstein with E equals mc squared. The gravitational field actually carries some mass, or the equivalence of mass. And when you put that in, that fixes the orbit of Mercury, and it actually fixes some smaller issues with all the other planets as well. So what I want to do today is I want to introduce cylindrical coordinates, I want to introduce spherical coordinates, and I want to do the calculations. Uh, I do not like the book's notation. The book's notation is correct for this class, but it is not correct for physics classes. So math books and physics books interchange the use of theta and phi. Anybody here taking a physics class? So two people are taking physics classes. Have you done spherical coordinates? Do you have any spherical coordinates? Okay. <coughs> I'm trying to decide if I want to do things with the physics notation or the math notation. You know, as we're doing physics problems, I'm tempted to use the physics notation. Um, the math notation, I do agree, makes a little bit more sense than the physics notation, but I'm used to the physics. I will let you vote right now. This is one of the advantages of being the 10 o'clock and not the 11 o'clock. Your decision will bind the 11 o'clock. Do you want the math notation or the physics notation? The math. math. All right, we're going to do the math notation. All right. <coughs> Cylindrical coordinates. <coughs> so you have x, y, z goes to r, theta, and z. So x is our cosine theta, y is our sine theta, z is z. And you get dx, dy, dz goes to r, dr, d theta, dz. What shape do you think cylindrical coordinates are designed for? Cylinders. Cylinders. Now this is one of the shapes I can actually draw. So cylindrical coordinates are wonderful if you happen to be integrating over a cylinder. And so what we would have is the integral, maybe um, z goes from a to b, x squared plus y squared less than equal to um, big R squared of f of x, y, z, dx, dy, dz would go to the integral z goes from a to b, the integral theta goes from 0 to 2 pi, integral r goes from 0 to r, and now we would have f of r, 
cosine theta r sine theta z d r dr d theta dz. Okay, so this is cylindrical coordinates. This is what the cylinder looks like in XYZ space, in Cartesian coordinates. What do you think the cylinder looks like in cylindrical coordinates? Square. Box. Box. So you've got to be very careful. If, if you say rectangle, you cover your ass because that way, if it's not a square, you're still okay. And so it's actually going to be a three-dimensional. It's going to be a box. So it's going to look something like this. And again, this is why we like things like cylindrical coordinates. Because it converts an integral over a shape that's a little bit hard geometrically to a shape that's very easy geometrically. It's a rectangle in each direction. It's a box. And I do think it's okay to say rectangle as opposed to box because in some sense, z is just along for the ride. Right? It's basically just taking a circle and dropping it. Or if you want, taking a circle and raising it. I don't care which way you're doing it. And so z is just along for the ride. There's really no difference between cylindrical coordinates and polar coordinates other than you just have this extra z floating. So it's not a big deal. Okay? So again, as always, we have to think, how does our function transform? I take my function f of x, y, z. I replace x with our cosine theta, y with our sine theta, and I replace z with z. Okay, any questions about this? Okay, yes? Can you just like, explain the bounds a little bit? Right? So the, the, the bounds over here is exactly as I have for polar coordinates. You know, if I have a circle of radius r centered at the origin, theta goes from 0 to 2 pi, go all the way around, and the radius goes from 0 to big R, the radius of the circle. And then z is going from a to b. So if I were to draw it over here, here is z equals a, here z equals b, and here is a circle of radius big R. And so that's exactly what would be going on here. Any other questions on cylindrical? Okay. Because you have all elected to do math and not physics, uh, you are now required to pay very close attention to what follows because I was taught physics perspective before I was taught the math perspective. Whatever you see first is the one that sticks in. And so I will try to do the uh, math on the fly, but I will almost surely mix up my thetas and my phis at some point. So watch carefully. Okay. Spherical coordinates. All right. So here is, you know, a sphere. I have the center, z is going to be in this direction, x in this direction, y in that direction. And I want to figure out good coordinate systems. So again, it should make sense that if I give you three points, three pieces of information, I can specify where I am on the sphere. The question is which three points do I want? Well, I need to know the radius, how far am I from the origin. And then I have some choices for the other things. So the first we're going to do is here's the z-axis. And we're going to talk about the angle we come down. And I will use the math and I will use phi for the angle we come down. I agree that this is a better choice than the physics notation, but I am used to the physics notation. The physics notation uses theta here. And again, does it matter if I call this phi or theta? Does it matter when you're looking things up in books? Yes, you have to make sure you check which book you're using. Some books will use it the other way. So phi is going to measure how far I come down from the z-axis. And then once I come down, I will spin some amount. Okay? And so now I come down and I spin some amount. And the amount I spin is going to be theta. What should I use for the radius of a sphere? 
You would expect ah, but they don't like to use ah. They use low. low. And I will try to justify the notation in a moment. What is the range of phi? So here, rho is going to go from 0 to r. And we have a circle, we have a sphere of radius r. What do you think the range of phi is going to be? 0 to pi. 0 to pi. Why, why only to pi? Why don't it go all the way around to 2 pi? Because then we would be doing that circle twice. Why would we be doing the circle twice? Because you also have theta. Because we also have theta, and theta spins all the way around. So if we have theta going from 0 to 2 pi, then if I want to get any point over here, I just come down here and then spin around on the circle. So I only need to have phi go from 0 to pi. You can generalize this and actually write down coordinates on an n-dimensional sphere. It's a little bit more work. For the most part, I think a three-dimensional sphere is more than enough. Okay, so we now have the range of our variables. Okay. Okay, it's not just me hearing that. Okay. So we have <laughs> the range of the three variables. All right. We now have to figure out what is x, y, and z in terms of rho, phi, and theta. And as we do this, you'll see why they call this rho, and you'll see why the mathematicians are correct to call this phi and not theta. One of the things is easier than the other. Which is the easiest, x, y, or z? I feel like Freddy Krueger is about to walk in. So which is the easiest, x, y, or z? z? Z. All I need to do for z is this is rho, this is phi. So z is going to just be rho cosine phi. So z is rho cosine of phi. That's going to give me this length right here. Okay, now that I have rho cosine phi, I need to figure out x and y. In geometry, we learn to love drawing auxiliary lines. There's a really good auxiliary line that we can draw here. It's the line from here to this circle. And we need a name for that. What would be a really good name for that length? R. R. And that's why we're using rho here. Because we use R here, this now puts you exactly in the situation of polar coordinates. Where you have R, and then you have theta talking about how far you go along. And that's why the mathematicians prefer to use theta here and not phi. So we will call this length r, and that is going to be uh, rho sine phi. So if you think about what's going on now, I'm going to just draw this. Oh, try again. I will draw a circle now of radius r equals rho sine phi and we move some amount of theta. And so now we just do polar coordinates. It's now polar coordinates with r equals rho sine phi. And so we get x is equal to r cosine theta, which is going to be rho sine phi cosine theta. And we'll get y is r sine theta, which will be rho sine phi sine theta. And so these are the coordinates. You give me an x, y, and a z. I want to try to figure out rho, theta, and phi. I will leave that inversion to you or just watch the video. It's similar games to what we did in Polar. Uh, very easy to get some of them. Which is the easiest to get of rho, theta, or phi from x, y, z? Which would be the easiest? I'm sorry? Do I want to get rho, theta, or phi? Which is the easiest? Rho. If I'm on a sphere of radius rho, x squared plus y squared plus z squared is rho squared. So if you just check and look at what is x squared plus y squared plus z squared, you will get x squared <coughs> plus y squared plus z squared is rho squared. Okay. The next thing is then you want to try to find the rest. Well, once I know rho, if you give me z and rho, <coughs> cosine of phi is z divided by rho, z divided by square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. If I want to get 
theta, if I take the ratio of x over y, the rho sine phi's cancel, and I get x over y is the uh, cotangent of theta, or y over x is the tangent of theta, and then you can solve exactly as before with both. Okay, so I'll leave you the exercise of writing down the inverse transformations. This is how you set up the polar coordinates, uh, how you set up the spherical coordinates. But there's one more thing we need. What else do we need? If I want to convert from integrating in Cartesian coordinates, x, y, z, to integrating in spherical coordinates, I need to know more than just how the functions transform. What else do I need? I need to know how the differentials transform. I need to know what is my conversion factor. And so for my conversion factor, that's a little bit more involved. So spherical. <coughs> so it's dx, dy, dz is d rho, d theta, d phi. Right or wrong? Wrong. Not even close. What's bad about this? It's in meters. It's in meters. All right, so how can I fix this? Multiply by meters squared. Multiply by meters squared. So what would give me a meter squared? Row squared. Row squared. Okay, so we know that's gone. So let's try dx, dy, dz is rho squared, d rho, d theta, d phi. Does that seem reasonable? Whether or not it's right, does it seem reasonable? Mm -hmm. It at least seems reasonable. It turns out to be wrong as well, but it's a natural thing to try. How should we view rho squared? We should really view it as dx dy dz is d rho rho d theta rho d phi. Right? That's where the rows live. Well, when I look at what's going over here in terms of phi, that's fine. You know, my radius is rho. But when I'm going along in this circle, what is my radius in that circle? Ah. So maybe, instead of this, a better thing would be dx dy dz is d rho r d theta rho d phi. You know, rho d phi is going to give me the correct length of this arc over here, but when I'm doing my arcs on this circle, it's supposed to not be rho, it's supposed to be r, because that is the radius. So I should get dx dy dz, just putting things in the part, is rho squared sine of phi, d rho, d theta, d phi. Rho will go from 0 to r, phi will go from 0 to pi, and theta will go from 0 to 2 pi. And when you look at what we have, this is extremely reasonable. Why is this reasonable? Sine of phi is always non-negative. This is always greater than or equal to 0. I shouldn't have a negative coming in with my volume element. Otherwise, I could have the ridiculous situation where the volume becomes negative. Okay. Any questions on this rough heuristic as to why this is the correct volume element? Yes? Can you explain again how we get between the, the fourth one and the fifth one? This one and this one? Mm -hmm. I'm just substituting for what R is. I'm just using R equals rho sine of phi. And so over here I have to remember that when I'm on this circle, my radius has been shrunk a little bit. And because the radius has been shrunk a little bit, it's not really rho d theta that I have, it's really r d theta that I have. Again, this is not a complete proof, this is close to a proof. This is essentially taking what we did in polar and just bumping it up to spherical. Other, yes? Do people usually list theta than phi or when you're uh, integrating? Or usually people don't, uh, don't care. Is that a, I almost used stronger language. Okay. 
Uh, the problem here is I am so used to the physics notation yeah. that they could do um, maybe d rho d phi d theta. It doesn't really matter because we're integrating over a rectangle. Yeah. And so because we're integrating over a rectangle, you can do it in any way. And so again, that's the whole point is that now, not a rectangle, I'm uh, sorry, a box. So the sphere in Cartesian looks like this, and in rho, theta phi, it looks like a rectangle. So because it's a rectangle, I can write these down in any way I want. Which angular integral do you think is going to be harder? The theta integral or the phi integral? And if you get the answer wrong, just say you were using physics coordinates. Which one do you think is going to be harder? Do you think the theta, uh, the theta and the phi integral is the same, or is there a difference between them? The phi. The phi? Why the phi? Because it has the sine. It has the sine of phi. So that could make things a little bit more difficult. Okay? All right. So what I want to do is I want to say one last thing and then move on to an example. Right. Is everybody comfortable with the motivation as to how we get here? Right. So I can cross off all these things that were wrong. I'll leave that on the bottom. And then we have the following. The integral over x squared plus y squared plus z squared less than equal to r squared of f of x, y, z, dx, dy, dz, make sure you leave plenty of room, is the integral phi goes from 0 to pi, integral theta goes from 0 to 2 pi, integral rho goes from 0 to r, f, or x is going to be rho sine phi cosine theta, y is going to be rho sine phi sine theta, and z is going to just be rho cosine phi times rho squared d, uh, sine of phi d rho d theta d phi. Okay. And this is going to be how you integrate things back and forth. If at this point you are not too excited about replacing x with rho sine phi cosine theta, y with rho sine phi sine theta, and z with rho cosine phi, I don't blame you. You should not be thrilled about something like that. Right? So if I give you a function like f of x, y, z is x e to the y plus square root of z over 3x, this would be a nightmare. What kind of functions of x, y, z would you love to have? How do you want the function to depend on x, y, and z? <laughs> yes. Um, x plus y squared. Excellent. You want f of x, y, z to really be some function just of the radius. You want f to only depend on x squared plus y squared plus z squared. If that's the case, then substituting for this is very nice. It's like polar, you want things to only depend on x squared plus y squared. Do all functions of three variables only depend on x squared plus y squared plus z squared? No, if that was the case, then we would have the same weather as Florida. And as somebody who was driving back through a snowstorm, this was not what I was expecting you know, yesterday. It matters where you are on the surface of the Earth. It would be nice if it didn't. Or at least it would make a lot of the calculations simpler. And for a lot of things, it's not going to matter. In Newton's law of gravity, all that matters is the distance you are away from something. It doesn't matter if you're here or here or here. As long as it's the same distance away, you feel the same force. You feel a different direction, but you feel the same magnitude. Okay. So again, we can now do problems like this. It's now reduced to how many Calc 2 problems? Three Calc 2 problems. Okay. All the Calc 3 is in changing the coordinates, is in changing the bounds of integration. And now that we've done that, it's now three Calc, three calc 2 problems. Okay. Are we ready now for the Calc 3 problem that's worth doing? All right, it's going to be close. We have 14 minutes to do it.
But again, this is not a cookbook problem. This is a problem that is worth doing. So all mass may be regarded as instant. And I'm going to make some simplifying assumptions. You don't have to. I'm going to assume I have uniform density. Okay? And so if I assume uniform density, it's going to make things a little bit easier. You can do it more generally. What quantity do people use to represent density in physics and chemistry? Mm -hmm. Rho. Okay? You can understand why I don't want to introduce rho for density right now. Okay? So let's say you have a sphere of radius A. I'm sorry, radius R. The density is 1. The mass is going to just be the volume of the sphere times the density. What's the volume of, a, of the sphere? Four thirds pi r cubed. And we'll call this m2, you know, our second mass. And eventually, if this is going to be m2, we'll have a smaller mass over here, m1. And we'll be calculating the force of m1, the force exerted on m1. If you want to do this calculation, well, it's not a bad idea to try doing this integral directly. What should we choose for the function f if we want to calculate the volume of the sphere? One. One. So, could take f of x, y, z equals one. If f of x, y, z equals one, then f is a function just of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Everything is good. I will leave this as a calculation for you to do because it's just three standard calc two integrals. The phi integral, uh, it's a little bit of work. The theta integral is just going to be 2 pi. two pi. The rho integral is going to be a rho cubed over 3. So you'll get an r cubed over 3. Uh, there's the 3 that all we have to do is now integrate the sine of phi d phi from 0 to 2 pi. That'll get us, I think, like a 2 pi that we're missing. Okay? So I'll leave you to do the spherical integration here. What I want to do now is I want to calculate what is the force on this mass. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to use a lot of really good concepts. Where should I put my mass m1? Now it's going to be a certain distance away from the origin. Where should I orient it in terms of space? I can put it anywhere. I just put it right there. That was the first point that just my chalk hit. Is that where I should put it? Is that the best way of viewing? On an axis. Yeah, let's put it on an axis. Which axis? Z. Why Z? Why Z sounds funny, but... Yes, Z! Explain Z. There is a reason to choose the Z axis. Think of how we have the spherical coordinates. We set things up with an angle coming off the Z axis. So, it makes sense. Let's put the mass over here. So, if you want to think about what's going on... have a mass here some distance above the origin. Right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw very carefully the picture of what's going on. Okay. So here's the situation. So, with imagination, that's my sphere. What I'm going to do is I'm going to assume my point is above the planet. This is typically a reasonable assumption. Okay. If the point is inside, the calculation is a little bit different. In fact, there's a beautiful result that says if you have a spherical shell and you're inside the spherical shell, you don't feel any gravitational force. It all cancels out. All that matters is what's underneath you. I'm only going to do the case when we're outside the planet uh, as an exercise, you can do what's inside. So we are up over here. We have this distance, which I will call z. What I'm going to do is I'm going to replace my planet. I'm going to regard it as a bunch of concentric spheres 
at radius rho. And for each sphere of radius rho, I will calculate the net force, and then I will integrate over all rho to take into, their, to take into account their contribution. And rho is going to range from 0 to big R. So this will be the sphere of radius rho. And I'll be sending rho from 0 to R. OK? And I want to figure out what's the force. Well, Newton's law of gravity is force is g m1 m2 over r squared in the direction of connecting lines. So if I look at a little mass over here, it's going to give me a push in this direction. If I look at the corresponding mass over here, it'll give me a push in that direction. Notice that the non-z components of the force cancel out. And the only net effect is pulling it down. Okay? So really, when I'm calculating the force, I only have to calculate the force in the z direction. The other directions will not matter. Okay? So now, what's my infinitesimal mass element? The infinitesimal mass element, dm2, is going to be rho squared sine of phi d rho d theta d phi. That's going to be the small little mass element from something over here. And then I will just integrate over all possibilities. So I'm finding what is the pull from each part. All right, so now let's draw the picture very carefully. So here's rho. And then I'm going to, a little bit overload notation, I'm going to use the letter r here. It's not the same r as before. r is just the distance between uh, where I am and that infinitesimal mass. So I have phi as my angle over here. I'm going to let A be this angle over here. A, Sally, is going to depend on phi. It's going to depend on theta. It's going to depend on rho. It's going to be somewhat involved. Okay? Any questions on what we've done so far? So I need to figure out some relations. I'd love to know A in terms of other things. So I've got this whole side over here is Z. The cosine of A times this is going to give me my force. So Z component of force is going to be G M1 DM2 over R squared times the cosine of A. Does anybody know a way to relate the cosine of A to quantities that I have? How can we relate the cosine of A to quantities we have? I'm sorry? I have a triangle and I've given you three sides of a triangle. It is the law of cosines. So from the law of cosines, we get rho squared is z squared plus r squared minus 2zr cosine of a. So the cosine of a is going to be z squared plus r squared minus rho squared all over 2zr. Okay? It's going to be useful later. I can also do something for the cosine of phi, and I would get r squared is equal to z squared plus rho squared minus 2 z rho cosine of phi. Therefore, the cosine of phi is equal to z squared plus rho squared minus r squared divided by 2 z Rho. Okay. The following is going to be extremely useful later. Z is fixed. If I'm on a sphere of radius rho, rho is fixed. So there's only one thing that varies. Little r varies as phi varies. So I actually have a relationship that relates r to phi. Well, this is good. I care about r, but r is not one of my coordinates. And so what I can do is I can use this to do a change of variables, a use substitution. And what I will get is if I take the derivative of this, I'll get negative sine of phi d phi is equal to, now I take the derivative, 
And so z squared plus rho squared over 2z rho, that's constant. So I will get a negative 2r dr over 2z rho, or just r over z rho d rho, with the minus sign. So the two minuses will cancel. And then the question is, what is the range? What is the range of my angle phi? Phi goes from where to where? So in spherical coordinates, phi goes from what to what? Zero, Zero to pi. So then we get r is going to go from, well, when phi is equal to zero, what is r? So when phi equals zero, what's the radius? It's going to be z minus rho. So it's going to go from z minus rho to z plus rho. Because when phi equals zero, we're right up here. And how far am I from this point? It's z minus rho. When phi equals pi, I'm all the way down here. It costs me z to get down to here, and then another row to get there. Okay? So now, we're at the point where we can solve the problem. So, the magnitude of the force is going to be the following. The integral, and then I will get g m1 over r squared cosine of a rho squared sine of phi d rho d theta d phi. Phi goes from 0 to pi, theta goes from 0 to 2 pi, and then rho goes from 0 to r. Okay. So this is just setting up the spherical coordinates. This is writing down the integral. This is the magnitude of the force. Okay. The sine of phi, we actually have a way to replace sine of phi d phi with r over z rho, but only if we are considering rho fixed. So the problem is, I want to switch the order of the theta, of, of the phi and the rho integrals. Can I switch the order of the phi and the rho integrals? Yeah, I'm integrating over a rectangle. What's the integral over theta? 2 pi. 2 pi. So I get 2 pi. Integral rho goes from 0 to r. Integral phi goes from 0 to pi. g m1 over r squared. The cosine of a is z squared plus r squared minus rho squared over 2 z r. Sine of phi is r over z rho d theta, I'm sorry, d phi, d rho. All right. This r cancels with that r. I have a z squared that I can pull out. The 2 cancels with this 2. So I'm going to get g m1 over z squared times pi times the integral rho goes from 0 to r, the integral r. And now I'm going to change coordinates. I'm going to use, oh, I, I dropped the sine of phi, sorry. Sine of phi, d phi, d rho. I'm going to use, oh, no, no, I, I put in the sine of phi over there. Okay. D phi, d rho. And so now, little r is going to go from z minus rho to z plus rho, and I will have z squared plus r squared minus rho squared. I have an r squared. r squared over r squared is 1 minus z squared minus rho squared over r squared. d r d phi, d rho. Okay. So we're almost done. We just have to finish off this integration. So how do we finish off this integration? We need to find a function whose derivative is 1 minus z squared minus rho squared over r squared. So the antiderivative is going to be r, and I think this is, I'm sorry, this is a plus sign. It's going to be r 
minus z squared minus rho squared over r squared. Over r. So if I take the derivative of this with respect to r, the derivative of r is 1. The derivative of negative r, 1 over r becomes plus 1 over r squared. That's going to be this piece. So this is going to give us g m1 pi over z squared integral rho goes from 0 to r. Now I have this integral evaluate at z minus rho and z plus rho. When I do this at z minus rho and z plus rho, I'm going to get a 2 rho. Over here, when I put in a z plus rho, z squared minus rho squared is z minus rho plus z plus rho. That's going to give me a z minus rho. Then I'm going to get a z plus rho from the other. I subtract. I'm going to get a negative 2 rho. Negative, negative is positive. Becomes plus 2 rho. Uh, how many rho's do I have? I have... I think I dropped a rho squared. Uh, there should have been a rho squared here. I apologize. So we have uh, one of the rho's cancel with that, so I still have a rho over here. I have a rho d rho. So I integrate 4 rho squared. 4 rho squared becomes... 4 thirds rho cubed, g m1 over z squared, 4 thirds pi r cubed. That's our second mass. g m1 m2 over z squared. Okay? There you go. One of the most important integrals of all time. Alright. So I know I went over by a minute or two. This is one of the times in life when it is required. Okay? <laughs> Run to class if you need to. All right.